Yeah. Uh, no, understood. Understood. Okay. I think we are going to be live. This always takes a second, so I got to make sure that, like, because uh, sometimes I find myself talking to myself for like a minute and a half or so if I don't get the thing right. All right, we aren't. We're on. All right, we're joined right now by Dust James, uh, a Marxist-Leninist uh, truck driver, um, one of the essential workers uh, still out there today. Um, so um, let's just get let's get right into this. I'm, I'm really, really fat. I'm really interested in. Uh, I'm really happy that you joined us. I'm really happy to be doing this uh, at six o'clock in the morning here in Los Angeles. I'm not sure what time it is out there, um, but we're really excited to really excited to have you here today because we got we got some interesting things to talk about that we we would normally uh, would normally have the opportunity to. So, um, Dusty, you're originally from um, Northern Appalachia. Uh, some people consider that. Yep. Uh, around Ithaca, uh, the few so, kind, of, kind of south central counties, um, kind of hilly counties, south central upstate New York. So for those of our uh, listening right now, I mean, I think Appalachia exists in, in many people um, in their mind kind of like as an idea and not necessarily. I mean, they don't they don't have a real uh, grasp on its geographic boundaries. So what 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 is generally considered Appalachia and, and greater Appalachia and and can you can you can you place that on a map for us? Um, uh, a lot of folks consider the heart of Appalachia to be like West Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee. That's like the heart, and that's like, and then the Greater Appalachia could be considered all the way from Georgia, uh, the mountains, all the way to upstate New York. Okay. Um. But what should people know? What 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 are he like? What's what's going on right now in uh, in Appalachian country uh, during um, in Appalachia during the okay. uh, crisis? So it, it's Mao actually at one point uh, postulated that Appalachia was its own oppressed nation. Um, whether that's true or not, that would take some studying. Um, and it's been developed and it, and conditions have changed. But if you look at the conditions, similar to how uh, you know, Afro-American nation, uh, Aslan nation are kept in conditions of poverty and have less access to limited resources. You can say that's true of the population in that geographical location, especially uh, in the heart of Appalachia. Like there's let there's less access to health care. Um, there's less access to, to certain foods. Um, there's less access to jobs. Um, a lot of folks are in the, are, are hooked to the coal industry or in towns that have been decimated uh, because the coal industry left. Um, and there's health problems associated with coal and stuff like that. And <clears throat> Yeah. Definitely. I mean, um, that's that's you know that's, that's that. so for for those who are let's say get, they get radicalized uh, or those who find kind of like left politics in Appalachia, do they tap into the kind of I mean, from an outsider perspective, I, I know there's a good Facebook group, Weird Appalachian. There's a lot of communist and anarchists and stuff on there. Yeah, but I mean, is there a sense uh, for those who who um, who kind of uh, tend towards? Uh, who moved towards, um, you know, leftist radical politics within Appalachia to tap into the the labor struggles, you know, like Fire Mountain, all, all those kind of iconic yeah, struggles. There's, there's history. There's history. Like if you look at the the Battle of Blair Mountain in I think 1920s was one of the biggest armed conflicts on U.S. soil. <clears throat> and then you got order organizing in the 70s where communists went into coal mining camps and stuff like like I, I know the history, I know the culture, I've been around it. Um, I drive around there, you know, <clears throat> talk with people. <clears throat> uh, the place I'm from is really outside of a college town, and uh, the main industry up there is sim is a lot similar to like the Northeast as well. There's a lot of dairy farms, hay fields, and what I always say. Uh, from where I'm from, like the in rural America in general, is when NAFTA got passed, which put southern farmers out of out of business in Mexico. It also disrupted uh, rural and agricultural economies, mm -hmm. um, and it 
it was a shift from fa- smaller family farms um, to the corporate farms taking over, and yeah. which which was money took out of the economy, and that's really why um, my family was forced out. We were my dad was I don't know he was youngest of six kids I guess, and he didn't you know he was kind of on the edge of the economy you know and when and when that shift happened he was basically forced out. There was no jobs up there. It was either government job or that was about, you know, that was about it. Yeah. So you say you're from originally around the Ithaca area? Yeah, yeah. So around there, that's where Cornell's at, right? Yeah, that's where Cornell's at. I got I got an interesting story. My, my dad was actually uh, – my grandpa took my dad to watch the, the campus revolt as a child, like on a hill at a mountain on a, like next to it, watching it, um, just cause he was interested. And I actually met Ed Whitfield when I was organizing in Greensboro later on, that was one of the first people I ran into who, um, has this iconic picture of him with like bullets on his chest in that, uh, struggle. So what is the um, what's the relationship between like here here in Los Angeles you have these really kind of um, or or just general Southern California area we have these kind of uh, not always positive relationships between uh, these universities and and uh, the areas around them so yeah uh, USC yeah, for instance yeah. really bad with the relationship with the with the surrounding area Chapman University in Orange is it, they're they're behind a lot of the gentrification and and gang injunctions and stuff, trying to push people out so they can buy a property. Uh, what about, what, what? tell us about Cornell and its relationship to it. You know, I, like I said, I moved from there when I was five. I'm mostly, I'm mostly familiar with North Carolina, but um, I know one story that's pretty interesting, kind of a cultural clash where uh, the folks um, the, the folks that vote in the college, the people in the rural areas are more, are usually more conservative. Mm-hmm. And the folks on the college, they voted in the county to outlaw the hunting of deer. And now for the folks that commute to and from the town, they hit deer all the time because <laughs> there's so many of them. It's almost like a preserve. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, hunters that you need to keep the population down or they go crazy. And they're like pests. Yeah. That's, a- <laughs> that's- so that's one relationship between coming to Ithaca College folks and the and the folk, people that work in the dairy farms and hayfields and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, wow, that's interesting. That's really interesting. Um, so okay, so so you you you're born there, but then later on, uh, because of NAFTA and and various other things, um, your family finds yourself in uh, the Carolinas. So what was that? What was that move like? What was it like? Growing Five up? years old. So. When people say New York, they usually think the city, right? You know, anywhere. So, and then they're like, "So I come down here, rural, rural area," and uh, everyone's like, "You're from New York. You're some Yankee. You need to get out of here." You know, and I'm poorer and more rural than they are, for the most part. And there's this kind of fake, kind of mama's boy, uh, you know, mama's money type of fake Southern culture that really pisses me off <laughs> yeah. that I had to deal with, you know, people that got mama's money and they jacked their trucks up funny and they buy from Bass Pro Shop and they never actually worked a field or, or, or actually had to, you know, maybe they dress, they don't even dress what they hunt, you know? Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's kind of funny. <laughs> And so I got associated with some rich elite person because of my northern accent, more of a northern accent. It's changed, of course, now where I could actually pronounce 10 and 10 and, and you know, stuff like that. There's always an outsider to kind of the kind of folks in established middle class. Uh, so I got along a lot better with uh, people of color. And that's yeah, what I was around. That's what I did. Yeah, the, the, uh, the, um, it's kind of funny. I, from an outsider's perspective, I always think of, um, I don't know, when I think of people from the South who are, like, let's say, upper middle class, maybe even a little rich, I always have this like vision in my head of like like Ric Flair, 
<laughs> you know, but like these like like uh, these really outrageous polo shirts. And it was always like this weird imitation of like uh, of of like East Coast whatever, like trying to look a certain kind of way. But I don't know. That's just some idea that exists in my head. But um, uh, that's that's funny to hear you to hear you uh, reflect upon. Uh, I don't know the, the the southern the southern petty bourgeois or what have you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, with their airs. Um, so, uh, so, so you're there. You 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 move into um, a neighborhood. Now, you, I remember, you know, in our, in our conversations, you said this was kind of a primarily Mexican neighborhood. So, what what is what was that like growing up in a, in a primarily? Well, what are for our for our listeners? What what? Okay, they're not used to hearing about uh, uh, Mexicans in North Carolina. That's a little that's a little new well, to, to some people. Uh, Mexican migration in North Carolina is huge. It's one of the biggest, like, per capita um, places with Rasa uh, outside of Aslan. And it's usually, it's mostly started with the tobacco industry. Um, and then you, we got meat packing and stuff like that. That was, that was what the community I was in was around, was uh, chicken plant processing. So the place, the neighborhood I used to live in... Um, was a trailer park and it was out of the way there's only one way in and out they constantly set up roadblocks um try to get people because most of most of the people in the community were undocumented and almost everybody worked at a chicken plant and almost everyone was from Guerrero the same exact town in Guerrero yeah and it's recent migrants and most people speak Spanish parents speak Spanish and it, and it, most of the folks came in the nineties. So it's not really like real settled in, uh, people listen to banda regional music mostly. And there's, yeah. The... yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, that's cool. so what, what, the, the, the city you're in, what, 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 what population, what's like the population in general? Was it like the, well, the it's, I mean, interesting. I it's interesting. I've done, um, so in the public schools, it's one third, one third, one third, one third white, one third black, one third Latino, or mostly Mexican American. Mm -hmm. And then the pri and then we got there's private schools as well. Yeah, um, and they're mostly white. <laughs> okay, so it'll be, it'll be like, but generally, like, how many people live in the town? Like, how, what, what's it's like? Oh uh, shit, man! I don't even know. It's a, it's a it's a it's a small it's a small city. I don't know. In, in in southeastern terms, that's how you'd call it. Like Raleigh's a medium-sized city. Okay. Charlotte's a big city. Sanford would be a small city. Okay. Okay. So it's a it's a, it's a small city. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It has a brick, maybe two or three story downtown. The biggest building's two two or three stories, and it's all brick. And yeah. uh, Lee County's known for making bricks. They got red clay. Lee County, that's another thing. It's named after somebody who fought and died to preserve slavery. And his, uh, his image is on the outside of the courthouse where they tax us and criminalize us and keep mostly poor and brown folks in jail, cash bail system, et cetera, et cetera. Robert E. Lee? <laughs> yes, that's who the county's wow. named after. Okay, so, so, so as somebody who, uh, who's uh, you know, lived a lot of his life in the South, can you explain to our audience, or explain to me anyways, um, the, the veneration of General E. Lee when I was out there is actually higher. General Robert E. Lee is actually higher than that for Jefferson Davis. I mean, they, they really, Robert E. Lee seems to be their guy. Why, why is that? Robert E. Lee really adds to the myth of the, the cause of the, of the just South. And the mm -hmm. thing is Robert E. Lee kind of married into money. So his wife's family owned slaves, but he didn't personally own slaves. Mm -hmm. And he was kind of like dignified. You people saw him as a really strong general who didn't really fight for he he wasn't apparently he wasn't fighting for slavery, he was fighting for his region. It real there's a myth of the just south. And it was promoted by the uh, I think daughters of the Confederacy. And they would raise money pr and they've been putting this myth in, in the textbooks in the school, and it's very much a part of the culture. Okay. It's, and the historical understanding, if you go to a, a normal 
If you go to a, an average white person, they'll tell you that this, the South, the it, the war wasn't about slavery and all that, and all those lies and bullshit that was propagated by the, those groups. And the Robert E. Lee really fits into that that myth. It was about protecting Southern culture and dignity and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And it was, I mean, from a Marxist perspective, it's obviously um, about slavery. Marx called it the second revolution that destroy that needed to destroy a bloody revolution was necessary to destroy the slave owning class. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that explains a lot because I've always been curious as to like why it was that Robert E. Lee, um, more so than Jefferson Davis, was was is uh, kind of this. Uh, central figure of uh you know venerating um the south I'm like I, I never understood that because i was like uh and it seemed like jefferson davis was like you know the, the head guy in charge and then so I, I didn't get it but now that makes a lot of sense he's he's the one that they can try and pin some type of uh innocence uh on because of uh i don't know because they're bullshit but <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it makes it makes sense. Yeah, he personally didn't own slaves, but his wife's family did. So, <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, the whole yeah. Um, you know the the um the what's what's um. Well, oh, where do I go? The uh, what's what's interesting about uh, I should say what's interesting though, but what um what uh what is I I've always taken note of is the fact that um. Uh, what I've always taken note of is the fact that uh, why is my audio? Why am I? Can you, can you still hear me? Yeah, I can still hear you. Okay, so now you, only you're on screen, but we'll figure that out in a second. Um, Says you were now presented solo. I guess. I guess. I... Yeah. <sighs> okay. No, now you're pre- now you're not on there. All right. Oh, okay. uh, no, I went away. This the message. Ugh. All right. Um. So. What's always been interesting to me is the fact that um, Robert E. Lee actually was a was a quote unquote hero of the uh, Mexican American War, as was Jefferson Davis. Um, See, I, didn't, I didn't know that. Um, so yeah. from the the colonizer side. Well, yeah, well, I mean, the, 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 yeah, 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 from the U.S. But, I didn't know that. But so, but so was Grant. And yeah, so was, and so was, I think I think Sherman too, and I definitely know what was his name, the guy Whitfield or, or the guy. One of the union guys with starts the W. Um, Definitely, uh, it was the training ground for the Civil War. But both sides of the Civil War fought. Yeah, yeah. In the Mexican American War, and so to me, it's really kind of interesting this idea that um, the Mexican American War is a kind of a, a predecessor to the Civil War because Mexico had abolished slavery and the slave owners wanted more land. Southern planters, right? And I think there's a lot of truth to that. The Southern planters wanted that, but I think it's another part of American mythology. Um, that promotes like this, this the the beauty of the union that they were um, yes. that they were against this bit. No, they they wanted that land too. If you look at John Fremont, he's one of this this, this guy who was supposed to be you know abolitionist and speaking against this before the Emancipation Proclamation. Well, he's the first he's the first murderous you know white governor of California, like, killing all kinds of Mexicanos, killing all kinds of indigenous people. Um, so both sides of the Civil War, both both the Union and the Confederacy. Uh, were interested in the seizure of, 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 of they're both they're both invested in manifest destiny they're both invested oh, yeah. in the theft of more land uh walt whitman the very famous poet who was um enormous advocate for for uh, abraham lincoln wrote that moving poem about his death um he he was a avid avid supporter of manifest destinies oh yeah oh yeah so the whole thing's <laughs> 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 yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, 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 definitely. It was a coalition of folks. I'm not trying to glorify the North or whatever. It was a coalition of folks that helped destroy slavery, but it was also the beginnings of U.S. imperialism, and it was used to destroy the natives and all kind, you know, all kinds of other stuff. And there's like this myth around it. And I think if you look into like um, like the name Sherman is common mm-hmm. uh, in the African American community. And that's and it has more to do with the hopes and dreams of folks, and it really pisses off the races. It does, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's uh, I named my son Sherman, uh, mostly from the respect out of the African American community, not really for the general who also killed natives and stuff yeah. like that. <clears throat> um, 
Well, yeah, yeah, it's complicated. But then you also the Civil War, it's like they freed the, it's like so they were part of the coalition that destroyed a more backwards coalition and they yeah. used that ever since to like attach and you know to to try to you know, get the African American community in the you know in the South and the Black Belt to be loyal, you know, to that to the U.S. It's like a, a lie to it, you know, and to seem like good in general when they're, you know, <laughs> they you know they're the oppressors, they're colonizers. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, um, but yeah, no, there, there, there's a it is complicated. I mean, there, there, there's definitely things that they came out of. I mean, that was you know the, the abolition of slavery was definitely a good thing. I don't, when I want to get what i'm saying wrong here i mean i'm i'm just saying that like um it's very interesting though like this idea i mean like when i was in boston the city of boston uh i've never seen a city kiss its own ass so much i've, I've never seen a city so in love with itself um yeah. <laughs> there, i lived movies. in boston for a bit i actually uh yeah. i went up there to see some comrades mm -hmm. and uh i lived with a family from um from guatemala for a bit and I uh, worked as a day laborer um, to try to stay up there for a bit. Yeah. And, and my Guatemalan friend uh, is actually what encouraged me into getting the truck driving. Uh, Cause he was real. Cause I, uh, I went up there to be a day laborer and, uh, and being a day laborer, you go there at 5 AM and you may get a job. You might mm -hmm. work that day. And the fact that I had a license, they're like, damn, you got a license? You're driving a 15-passenger bus. I was like 20 years old, oh, shit. never driven outside of rural south. So yeah. I was, I had to drive a 15-passenger van because I have a license. And my Guatemalan friend, um, I ain't going to say his name, uh, security, whatever, yeah. but uh, he, he had to instruct me how to drive a 15 passenger van in Boston. And they also drive oh horribly up there. Oh my and God. He, he just, it, 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 so he was yelling at me before. I mean, I would like beep and take the lane. I had no idea how to check the mirrors. He'd be like, check the mirror. Look at that. Me, I keep me. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it was, <laughs> and that he pushed me. And once I did that, yeah. like, I think later on, I was like, shit, I can drive tractor trailers. Yeah. <laughs> Why well, you know I don't want to give people shit just because where they're from or whatever, but I do. But I'm just saying the the, the, the culture and the institutions. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh yeah, no, no, it's one of the snobbiest cities up there. <laughs> <laughs> the place I lived in for a bit, Chelsea. Yeah, uh, it's interesting. Started out as a mostly an Italian neighborhood. Now it's mostly a Guatemalan Central American neighborhood. Yeah. Well, that, that, no, I, I'm interested in that. But what what I was gonna say though is like there's all these monuments talking about various different things but one of the things i saw was like you know the you know, we here in boston we you know we fought the south we liberated everybody and it's like you know like 30 years ago you had people stabbing flags into people during like busing because of busing you had people mm -hmm. like stabbing flags in somebody's chest i mean the, the the amount of like the northeast um particularly the northeast talks about um this veneration of the union breaking the back of the confederacy oh, when yeah. you when just like 20, 30 years ago, these places, and to this day, I mean, you have you have uh, if you look at the, the the incarceration rates of African Americans in these areas. It's just, oh yeah, oh, some yeah. of them are higher. Than, some of them are worse than the South in terms of just the. In, 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 oh yeah, they say uh, so. Racism, South versus North. They yeah. say in the South, you can be close to people. Uh, you know, you can be close to white folks, but you can't get any higher than them. And the North. You can get as high as you want, but you can't get close to <laughs> like the segregation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The yeah. It's intense. It's intense. I mean, you know, it, it exists here in Los Angeles too, but like, I mean, I, it, when you're, when you, when you're in uh when I've been to the East coast, I mean, it's just the, the level of, um, the level of like aggressive, like, uh, it, it, I don't know. It, it's just different. It's different. Um, and I don't think it's, I mean, the South is, I mean, the South's pretty bad too. I mean, the South's pretty, I mean, it's not, not to, it's just to, different. It's just different. Not to sugarcoat it, yeah. but it, it's, uh, <laughs> but the East Coast really doesn't have anything. To, they really don't have, I mean, nowhere in this country really, but, but particularly there, they, they don't really, they, they have no, they don't have call to pat themselves on the back. It's not like, it's not, it's not, it's not. Yeah. I mean, racism permeates every aspect of our society and culture and the way it's set up 
and it, and it keeps, you know, people of color in the working class in their position and it needs people in that position and it makes all kinds of justifications to do it. I mean, it's a U.S. imperialist agenda me. Absolutely. And, it makes, and it, that's how the societies form. <laughs> yeah. So you, um, we, you know, it's really interesting to talk about U.S. Uh, imperialism in this period of time because so we're, we're, we're in this health pandemic. We're in this health crisis. We're in this time where it's global, it's a global pandemic and people um, are dying. And, and um, when, when there are outbreaks, they die at horrific uh, rates, um, especially the elderly all throughout the world. It's really, it's a really, it's a, it's a trying time. Yet in this time, the United States is still sending warships to Venezuela. They're still uh, ramping up sanctions against Nicaragua, ramping up sac- mm-hmm. sanctions against Iran. They're still trying to overthrow people. They're still trying to, um, I mean, it's gotten so buffoonish that, you have actual, like, you know, um, naval commanders not wanting to take people on the ship because they're worried oh, yeah. about the virus and people being in such close proximity to one another. Um, and then they're fighting with, uh, with, uh, with the administration because the administration is so gung-ho on getting the story somewhere else and on getting it, you know, to, like, pro-war kind of thing. That's ridiculous. Oh, yeah. Um... Yeah, I actually had an interesting – I met this guy, Mark Shear, which I met through watching Caleb Moffat's show. And he's actually from Texas but lives up here. And he's like your standard conservative uh, – not standard conservative really, but he, he kind of buys in. He voted for Trump, and now he's against Trump. But he, he actually shared something on Facebook saying how the damn Chinese are more Christian than Americans is they're sending supplies to Syria and Iran and stuff. And the U S is the one st- uh, killing those people. Yeah. I thought it was interesting. Even it's so glaringly obvious. Yeah. Of what the yeah, U S so- is doing. The criminals, like it's horrific. It's stuff that should, you know, be taken to the Hague, you know, these are war crimes. This is this is the purpose killing. Like in normal times, that's what it is too. Like when a COVID nineteen ain't going on, these sanctions are killing people, not letting them have medical supplies for political interest. Inter- um, interest. It's terrorism. But now in a global pandemic, it's just glaringly obvious. Yeah, I think I think there's a lot of things that are being made glaringly obvious in this time. Um, it's glaringly obvious. So so another one will be that. Uh, I mean, just look at look look at what China was able to accomplish within like a week and a half in the building of hospitals, oh, and yeah. then the United States. Compare and contrast that with the U.S., where you know we're getting ventilators from veterinarians. Oh yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Um, like I'm a scientific socialist, Marxist, Leninist, but I. From my understanding, China has built socialist infrastructure. If you look at the material conditions of how they've raised people out of poverty, um, how the trade um, that they're offering other people is far better conditions than the West, and it shows. Um, In Vietnam as well, um, those with socialist economies who see the people as assets – um, and it's not even a mere – it's not even like a a moral liberal sense. It's a – material sense like that's an asset to them they protect that you know from a material level and it's it's <laughs> the world's changing it's definitely uh a uh, what do you call it um it, it's definitely i think that this pandemic is, is making it very clear that it's not just a moral question it's a rational question yeah, yeah. having a planned economy is, is, is a more rational way of doing things precisely it's a stronger system overtaking a weaker one. Mm-hmm. I think that another good example would be if you look at the way Cuba is able to respond to hurricanes versus uh, versus Florida. Oh yeah. You see, in the situation in Cuba, they're able to like you know whatever. Even with even because I've been you know I've been I've been to Havana and even with um with with the limited with the limited um technological capacities they have so the limited like objects they have per capita which is say uh, things they have per capita the pens they have per capita you know like uh whatever even with a with an older infrastructure just because there's a political will to evacuate people they'll get like old school buses and get people out and because the thing needs to get done it will get done you know with whatever they have you know it's, it's a very practical question it's not like some theoretical thing where a bunch of words are jargonistically tied together no it's very practical like, 
get people out of the place where the water is coming. But in the United States, we don't have that. Mm-hmm. So for our listeners, could you explain the difference between a market economy and a planned economy for, the, for those who might not be familiar? Okay, I mean, my understanding is um, to my definition of what determines something socialist or market economy um, or a planned economy, which I consider so, uh, a form of socialism, is what is in control. Is society designed in a way that its sole motivation is to produce profits for the elite? Or is it designed in a way to grow that country or protect the people there? Like, that's the difference. In the United States, as if you look at, just look at the fact they didn't take the, the, the cheaper, more effective tests from the Germans. Um, Trump refused to do that. He made sure that the medical companies would profit, which ki- which resulted in delaying of testing and hundreds of, and thousands of people, maybe hundreds of thousands of people dying um, because they didn't take those tests and weren't able to act. And then China, you know, shut down the economy, brought people's food in, you know, and so it's rule of profits versus and socialism's new. So, I mean, it's a new thing. It's a new field. Like, it's hard. You you know, you got to look at the conditions. I mean, you can't, like, have some idea, some liberal idea or some dogmatic idea about what socialism is. You have to see that what they have developed is different from what we have. You can look at it through the material conditions. Excellent. So we have a question here. Uh, It says, do you know if the trucking industry was mostly union back in the day? I know it's mostly contractual these days. Yeah, very controversial. You can't talk about truckers and unions without talking about Jimmy Hoffa. Yeah, Hoffa. (laughs) (laughs) And Jimmy Hoffa is a controversial figure. Mm -hmm. And the Teamsters and the strikes back in the 70s and the people who fought and died and shot each other are the reason why truckers still get paid as much as they do to this day. Mm Mm-hmm. And when they took down Hutafa was corrupt, maybe with the, the mob or what have you. But when they took him out of power, they replaced him with somebody who was more in with the mob and was easier to control. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it was an attack on the Teamster, you know. I mean, that's <laughs> it was attack on workers power and wages have been going down since. And they have, you know, more more people, the deindustrialization um, of other industries where people are funneled into this to keep the lower wages has, um, has a lot to do with the crushing of the unions and the lowering of wages or wages have maintained become stagnant in the industry. So, so for those of us who are not truck drivers, can you tell us a little bit, I mean, what is life like in the, uh, the general life of a truck driver? I think there's like a lot of romanticism about it. And maybe some of it justified, some of it not. I mean, so you, you tell us. What, what, pre-crisis, what, what is the general life of the truck driver? And then we'll talk about, you know, how. So it, I started you know, driving uh, about seven years ago. So this is after 2008. So when I came into it, a lot of the over, older folks saying it was already worse than it would had already been. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the corporate companies are taking over and putting out the owner operators yeah. out of business. Um, which is lowering wages across. And uh, a lot of the places that have good unions to this day, like UPS, um, do contract out to non-union drivers. Yeah. So what kind of, what kind of, um, what kind of hours are you putting in just as a trucker? I mean, just, oh, just, okay. you know, like so trucker. right now I train. So I have anywhere from 16, 18 hour days. Jesus. Like, and it's six days a week. I get home one day and I do my uh, show. Um, like I'll be up all day training with him. I'll try to sleep while he's driving and I'll drive most of the night and I do flatbed. So I got to do chains and straps and secure the load and then tarps. It's a lot of heavy labor on top of driving and, and being up on long hours. Yeah. Yeah. Like so- not, not, not everyone can do this and it really takes a beating on you and your health your mental stability and a lot of folks only do it a few years and get out. Yeah. Yeah. 
So tell tell us uh, tell us about um, tell us about your show. Yeah, um, I started a show. Um, so I've been out here. I I read a lot of material. Um, I keep up with my news. I apply my science to current events. I've been doing it for a long time. And I was like, well, I need somewhere I can talk about this and do this. So I started a YouTube show and I do it once a week on my one day off. And I call it dust James weekly assault on us empire. Um, I kind of redid the tag. One of my favorite groups, uh, black agenda report. I redid their tag and applied it to me. Um, Revolu- uh, revolutionary anti-imperialist working class analysis. Yeah, I'm actually um, interviewing Margaret. Uh, yeah, Kendall, so. <laughs> I was yeah. super excited about that. <laughs> Love yeah, her new book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I actually, actually ended up writing a poem based on it. It's pretty, it's pretty exciting, pretty interesting. Um, yeah. So I. Uh, um, yeah, so so our, our viewers should definitely check out uh, check out your 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 channel. Um, we'll we'll drop a link in uh, in the comments section. Um, so I mean, I, I'm very fascinated. What what, what got you into what, what politicized you? What 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 uh, how, how what's your journey to, towards? Um, so I basically had two periods um, in high sc- in high school. Um, I was very, I actually, I wanted to be a preacher when I was 14 and it mostly was sermon on the Mount, like mm-hmm. the meek shall inherit earth. I came up with this concept of all where we should respect all of humanity. It was kind of like Christian pacifism. It started out that way. And then as soon as I got in the anti-war movement and I went to college and I got to Greensboro and I got with people that have been in the struggle for a long time. I, I was disassociated with from a the liberal college forces, you know, who do these meetings, have these book clubs. And I was immediately attracted to working class people in a union. Um, and it was there amongst folks like that. I learned Marxist Leninism in the from older, mostly African-American folks have been in the union struggle. Um, and I was involved in Occupy. I was involved. I actually ran. There was a, a liberal organization, Reform Immigration for America, which was kind of a Democrat funded group. But when it came to North Carolina, it basically started all the immigrants rights groups. Uh, the dream. That's how the dream, the local dream team got their start here. And I was actually running the Greensboro chapter out of my dorm room, uh, often answering the machine, <laughs> machine system uh, at one point. Um, and then I kind of, I kind of got burned out and dropped out, you know, probably a lot of it had to do with having such a hard childhood and background. I kind of got out of it, got into driving trucks. And just recently I've been, you know, I had, I had issues with, uh, alcoholism, um, as well. And I've re I got sober recently. I've been reading more. I'm trying to get back into it. How long have you been sober? Um, about a year and a half now. I've been uh, I've been sober for uh, uh, seven years. So I'm saying in my my I got a load. My messages are coming, but I can stay on here as long as All we right. need. Well, I'll, I'll let you go in a minute or two. Um, but I, yeah, I've been sober about seven years now. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was I was really reckless. Uh, drove my car into trees. It's kind of destroying my life. So it's been it's one of those necessary moves for me. So congratulations on your sobriety and, uh, and you know. Stay strong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. So. Uh. Yeah. I guess we we can we can wrap this up. I guess you 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 you're, you're a truck driver. You got you got you got places to go. You got you, know, you got people to see. Uh, loads to deliver. So. Um. What should people know about about truck drivers? Uh. In this in this period of crisis and what and, and, and. Okay. So. I think. I don't know. We're essential workers and we're being put at risk. I have to eat out every day. I have to come in contact with the shippers every day. I don't think we have it bad as some folks like the folks in retail and the people that have to deal with the public. Like they're really at risk and they make a lot less than I do. Um, But we're still out here and we're at risk, you know, and it's kind of scary and I don't have a choice. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, a lot of one of the things is I, I had a comrade from 
New Jersey actually shared this on Facebook. And recently was a, a little tiny thing that's been going on is so all the restaurants will only do drive through. Yeah. And we we got to park this thing wherever we can park it. So we'll walk up to a restaurant. And they don't let us do drive through. Yeah. And then so and then so we don't have any food. So if you see a truck, if you see somebody walk up to the drive through and you're sitting in your car, it might be a truck or you, and you could maybe drive them around to the drive through. That'd yeah. be nice. <laughs> <laughs> that is an odd dilemma that I would not, I would, I would not have, uh, not have thought of. Um, okay, so yeah, no, it's definitely they're, they're definitely you're definitely putting at risk, and uh, it's definitely a, um, yeah, it's just it's a, it's a, it's a, that's that's a hard one. Uh, I have one last kind of political question, and then then we'll get into the plugs and and things you have uh, that the oh. people should follow up with. Um, the question of automation. I mean, I was reading about about uh, um, the possibility of automating truck driving, but that still seems like a little far off way. But it seems like the threat of automation, like in many fields and sectors, is is even if it's not completely possible at this moment, it's used to, as a battering ram against um, against uh, organizing labor. You know, like you know, if you do that, here come the machines. You know, is that is that true in truck driving as well? Well, other than the unions that exist, I'd say it's changing quickly because the population's changing. Um, it's it's largely conservative, and it's hard to organize. And they're very individualistic; like they're out on their own. And a lot, you know, the older truck drivers usually more conservative white folk, but a new truck driver's coming in. Um, pushed out of the industrial economy or, you know, from poor and more communities of color. So I think there is more and more chance to organize and there's more leftists in truck driving, but it's, it's historically a conservative um, industry. Um, what's going on now recently is I just got pushed out of a manual into an automatic. Um, automatic transmissions were very expensive. They're becoming more reliable um, they're because the computers are getting better at saving on gas and having a manual transmission um, kept a lot of people out of the trucking industry um, because it was just one hurdle they had to go through. And now they can have it's basically more unskilled now that that's more automatic and less manual. And I don't know, it's truck driving is addicting. Like like when you got a manual, I've been driving over seven years, done all 48 states, done Canada and like you it's almost like breathing like you get addicted to sh the power behind shifting and be able to spe speed speed up when you want to use it for fuel you want to do what you have that whole aspect of my job as a trade has been taken out of it and now i got an automatic and damn thing shifts like a new trainee exactly when it's supposed to you know n not when you know i want it so i lost that control i lost that part of my trade and having more workers be able to come in in my lower lower wages. So you you you've been you've been alienated from your years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. I miss <laughs> it. <laughs> so Marxism comes to life. That's kind of interesting. It's like right there. <laughs> you can actually feel it. Um, okay. So the la uh, the uh, so so what is it? Uh, what 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 should people? Where, where can people follow you? I know you mentioned the YouTube channel. Is there any other thing you're doing that uh, you want people to be aware of? Or, or um, are there other things you think they should follow? Book recommendations, ideas? What, 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 is, it, uh, what is it you'd like to... No, just about? my show. Just go on Google or just follow the link below or go on Google and put Dust Jane's Weekly Assault on U.S. Imperialism. Uh, subscribe. Hit the bell on there. Uh, participate. Comment. Leave me comments. Uh, maybe if, if you're following this on Facebook and you uh, hit me private message on Facebook, any questions, anything like that. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I know you got a busy schedule and uh, really appreciate you. All right. Thank you. Have a good one. You too.